Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science for another month. I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. And we're, of course, brought to you by the University of Queensland and supported by our fantastic partners here at The Edge in the State Library of Queensland. I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge the ongoing efforts of those to protect and promote Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander cultures, which will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and communities. Tonight, we of course have a fantastic speaker who I'll introduce in a moment. If this is your first Briz Science, welcome. We are a series of free public lectures held once a month here at The Edge, where we bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research, cutting edge research, with all of us here in Brisbane. Um, we do a few things a little bit differently here. The first is, if you've got a phone, great time to turn it on, but on silent. And um, we will be live tweeting throughout the evening. You can catch us on the hashtag BrizScience or um, tag us at UQBrizScience. And we'll also be taking questions at the end of the night, either over Twitter with the hashtag BrizScience, or um, you can write down your questions. You might have grabbed a question slip on the way in. Write down your questions, and our wonderful team will come around and collect those at the end of the talk, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. If your question doesn't get answered, never fear. We will be having some food and drink afterwards, and you are more than welcome to join us outside and um, ask lots more questions of our speaker then, as well as each other. You know, good chance to network with the other like-minded scientists of Brisbane. I think that's all of the housekeeping to get us started. So tonight, our uh, speaker is Professor Ian Godwin, and he is a director at the Centre for Crop Science at Quaffey which is a University Queensland Research Centre for Agriculture and Food Innovation. And he, he might not look like, might not look like at it to look at him, but he has 30 years experience in plant biotechnology. And he recently completed, uh, published, I should say. <laughs> hmm. Recently published a new book, which we have here, Good Enough to Eat, looking at food, agriculture, and some of the myths around GM, genetically modified foods. So tonight, Ian will whet our appetites with uh, some discussion around the benefits and risks associated with these GM crops, and outline some of the exciting new breeding technologies that are now being available to us. To present a feast for our brains, please put your hands together for Professor Ian Godwin. Okay, I've got a roving mic on. You can hear me? Good, good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about whether GM crops are actually good enough to eat. Um, the fact that I've spent 30 years or more working on them probably tells you I'm a little biased. Um, I do wanna thank um, the science faculty for um, putting this on and also especially the, the, the library here. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, but I also want to thank um, HBO for not releasing this until next week, because otherwise I don't think a lot of you would be here. <laughs> and uh, Joel's already mentioned uh, my book. It came out earlier this year. Um, you can get a hard copy if you want at Avid Reader, or you can buy it online at you know all the good places. O only good places that have my book, right? <laughs> So, we'll start talking about food. And these are some of my favourite foods, well, except for the starfish, but they are food for some people. For some people, it's an absolute delicacy. Um, you've even got some lovely little flowers in a bowl, um, which my wife and I went to one of those, you know, posh restaurants where the, it was all about theatre and art rather than the food. Um, I was glad they had matching wines. Uh, because I was full as a gook by the end, and it wasn't with food. Uh, but I want to I want to talk about my grandfather. He's the one here dressed. Some of you will recognise that that's the ostrich feathers that the Australian light horse um, used to wear, 
And of course, any young soldier who was going on an all expenses paid by the government trip to France or Gallipoli in the First World War got their photo taken with this one. He wasn't a light horseman. Uh, he ended up working um, in railways, what they called trench railways. Uh, when I was 10, my granny died and he came to live with us. And, you know, I was always keen to find out about his, what he did in the war. You know, did you shoot Germans and things like that? Because, you know, that's what you do in the war, right? And uh, one day it was breakfast time and I, I was well brought up, of course. Had wonderful table manners and I said, Grandfather, would you like some jam? And he said... What sort is it? And I said, it's plum. And he said, I swore if I ever got through the war, I'd never eat bloody plum jam again. <laughs> so that, that was, uh, I guess it was PTSD. I don't think it had been invented then, and I was 10. It hadn't been invented in my brain. Um, this, is a, this is one of the favourite postcards where we've got a soldier asking the eternal question, he's eating plum and apple jam. What the hell is, when the hell is it going to be strawberry? And the fact was that it was the officers who always got strawberry and the enlisted folk got, got the, well, it was called plum and apple, but it was made by a mob called, whoops, sorry, I'll go back. It was made by a mob called Ticklers in the north of England. And it turns out that, firstly, no one liked the jam. Secondly, Ticklers turned out to be the biggest destination for British-grown turnips and Swedes <laughs> during the First World War. So that was probably what the main ingredient was. But the soldiers quite liked it because you could throw the jam out and there was a shortage of hand grenades, so they could make what they called Tickler's bombs. Very, very effective. Now, you all know that food's going to kill you, don't you? We all have food phobias. Every day we're told us what, what's going to kill us. This was actually very... This, this was published only four days ago, so this isn't in my book, obviously. Uh, but when you ask people, what's the main risks about what you eat? A lot of people are going to come up and say, oh, you've got to give up red meat. It'll kill you. It'll kill the planet. Well, that's what the death rate is with a, a, a high-end red meat. So we can actually see that it's, it's sodium, salt, and not eating your whole grains. So you've got to eat a lot of whole grains. So this, this is number of deaths in thousands per 100,000 in the population. So a lot of people die from not eating whole grains or eating too much salt. So I'm going to impose a few of my values on you because a lot of people's attitudes are to do with their values. Uh, I'm going to firstly... I'm just going to put this out there and say celery, to my mind, is probably not food. When I was an undergraduate student, I worked out at Stanthorpe one summer, cutting celery. What I discovered was, I didn't really like celery. By the time I finished cutting celery, I hated celery. The smell, the sight, even the sound, that crunch. Oh! Because that was the sound it made when you were cutting it. And it was loaded with Furano Kumarans. Unbeknownst to me, but I quickly find out, because two days later, I started to get blisters on my arms. Like all celery pickers get, these things actually sensitise your skin to ultraviolet radiation. Celery is not food. It's a poison. It's a toxin. <laughs> chocos, definitely not food. Some of the young people probably don't even recognise chocos. It was one of those foods that was probably very popular in the Great Depression. And seeing my parents grew up in the Great Depression, they felt they had to impose it on me. But my grandfather, the man who wouldn't eat plum jam, he also wouldn't eat tinned pears. What's the relevance? Because he said it was just chocos boiled up in sugar. Maybe he was right. Or well, that was a depression thing as well. It's nice, isn't it? It's actually got a terminology to describe it. It's phytodermatitis. This is actually from limes. There's even a syndrome called margarita mouth, and it comes from drinking lime margaritas in the sun. And who in their right mind would drink a lime margarita inside? <laughs> I ask you. There's been cases of people who have had celery soup and gone out swimming and turned bright red and become blistered from those Furano Kumarans. Now, I just want to do, I, I will mention to you 
My dad was an absolute cricket fanatic. He wanted me to play for Australia. I couldn't bat, I couldn't bowl, but I'll tell you what, I was a pretty good throw. I've got a lime here and I know how to use it. So be alert that I am armed and dangerous. Don't go out in the sun after this lime hits you in the head. So one of the things about food is it is a kind of magic because everything we eat has undergone a level of domestication because most things in nature, for very good reason, are poisonous. And we've selected things that aren't poisonous. We've also selected from Tio Sinte what is now modern maize. These are effectively pretty much the same species, but because we have selected them through domestication, we now have many of the foods that we have do not exist in nature. This is one of the best examples because if you want to be a food, well, you don't want to be a food, you just want to be a seed. And if you want to be a seed and are good at passing your genes on to the next generation, the best thing that happens when you're mature is you shatter, boom, and the seed gets dispersed. There's no seed dispersal on a maize cob. It just drops on the ground, they all try and germinate. It pretty much guarantees that nothing's going to survive into the next generation. I'll just talk to you a little bit about plant breeding because one thing about plant breeding and selection is it's a fairly recent 20th century invention in many ways. Um, you will note this is the yield of maize in the United States for... It, 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 and if, if the graph went back further, it'd be like that. Hardly any change. There's little ups and downs usually to do with drought. Hybrid production was introduced in the 1930s. Shortly after that, the first application of urea-based fertiliser, a synthetic nitrogen fertiliser. And shortly after that, this is what my plant breeding lecturer called the horse's ass syndrome. When you're ploughing between fields, or doing any sort of application of anything, you have to be able to fit a horse down between the rows. As soon as horses became not necessary, farmers actually twigged to the fact, we can actually grow these plants a bit closer. 30 inch rows was what happened. And as we can see, maize breeding has led to huge increases in maize yield compared to the background. That's what plant breeders have given us. And then more recently, Transgenic plants, or GMOs, have built on that even further. The first transgenic plants were actually made in a lab only in 1983. Um, and you can see this beautiful illustration here by Lara Simone, who's one of the postdocs at, in my building at UQ, just showing you that basically agrobacterium, nature's genetic engineer, can actually transfer genes, and all we have to do is change the genes that it transfers, because it normally causes a disease by transferring a bit of DNA to a plant. We change that and make it put in a gene for disease resistance, for better nutritional quality, etc., and we can do that. Of course, it works better with tobacco, because everything works with tobacco. When I was a postdoc, I was working in a lab, I was working on sugar beet, but there was a guy there working on tobacco. The aim of his project was to increase the nicotine content in tobacco. It was paid for by a tobacco company. He was shameless, absolutely shameless. And at that time, as we all know, all of the tobacco companies said, no, no, there's nothing addictive about nicotine or anything like that. So why were they trying to genetically engineer tobacco to have more of it? You have to wonder, don't you? To explain this kind of magic, the thing is, we've got these molecular biology tools. We can actually treat genes like Lego. You can put together any blocks you want. So in this case, we've got a, an eggplant gene, we've got an apple gene, we've got a potato gene, and the chimeric gene over here is just showing us we can take one piece from one species, one piece from another species, and another from another. We've got a chimeric gene. It might give us a new trait that we want to put into our plant or animal of interest. So by 1996, remember it was only 1983 that people first were able to do this, by 1996 GM tomatoes, maize and soybean were released and started to be taken up by farmers. That was a crucial time. If farmers didn't like it, no one was going to grow it. It had to make them more money, it had to improve their profitability, it had to make agriculture simpler and more efficient. And that worked, or farmers wouldn't have grown it. 
The downside to that was the traits that were being dealt with here were all about making life better for farmers and enabling them to produce food more efficiently and more cheaply. None of that translated into the minds of people who were buying the food and eating it. I don't care if a plant's insect resistant or not. In fact, maybe I do care if a plant's insect resistant because what did you use to make it insect resistant? These are the sorts of doubts that were in, in people's mind. Truth is though, by 2018, almost 200 million hectares of GM crops are grown around the world. Now I've turned this into a map of Europe. Well, I've said this is a map of Europe I'd like to have and Lara Simone has actually drawn it. But if we were to put all the GM soybean in the world into Europe, we would cover all of the United Kingdom and all of France all the lakes, the rivers, we, sorry, we'd have to get rid of Paris. We'd have to clear Paris and just put soybean there. We'd have to do the same with maize for Spain. Cotton would cover the whole of Italy. No more Alps. We'd have to laser level them so we could grow cotton. That's how cotton's grown. Canola takes over the Czech Republic and, of course, Germany. I have to say something about Germany. Germany is the most anti-GMO country in the world. Deutschland sagt nein. Richtig? It does. But Martin Keim, who's from the University of Göttingen in Germany, he did an analysis of what the first 20 years of GM crops gave us, and he said overall it led to a 37% less pesticide, 22% increase in crop yields, and more importantly, 68% increase in farmer incomes all over the world where GM crops were used. Now, if they didn't do that, people weren't going to grow them. No doubt about that, because farmers have to make a living, right? But he also said 80% of the population is anti-GM and the other 20% of people don't care. Our first crop in Australia was BT cotton. Beautiful photo taken by Jess Lehman, who's a, a cotton farmer. Um, before BT cotton was available, we had this pest, Heliothus, and Heliothus ate cotton like it was going out of fashion. And most, by the early 90s, most cotton farmers were spraying every second week, or sometimes more so, to control Heliothus. And the Heliothus started to develop resistance. So by the time we got to the early 90s, endosulfan, which was the main insecticide being used, was being sprayed weekly on every cotton farm in a cotton growing region. Can you imagine? Now I, uh, shortly after I recovered from my celery scars, I went up to Biloela and worked with a sorghum breeder up there. Um, and he invited me over for the weekend to his place. He was American. He said, have you ever had chili? And I said, yeah, I've had a chili. No, 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 proper chili. And we sat down and we started eating chili and this brown snake appeared out of nowhere. Naturally, being a you know, brave young Australian, or Queensland, Queensland, I mean, even better than an Australian, <laughs> I picked up a hoe and had a bit of a go at it. And then it had a bit of a go at me. And in the end, the hoe became a pogo stick. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ray, the sorghum breeder, appeared from, he was from Texas, he appeared from out of the front door with a shotgun. That pogo stick, I was moving faster than I have ever moved on a hoe as a pogo stick. He pointed his shotgun at the snake and it ran up inside a welding machine. I thought, is he going to shoot that welding machine? Next minute, the phone rang. Mrs. Brangman goes inside and she comes outside and she says, quick, everyone! I'm going, oh my God, it's gone inside the welding machine. It's called its family. They're all coming. And then we all raced over to the washing machine. We had to bring in the washing. I said, what's going on? She said, oh, the neighbour just phoned. He's going to spray his cotton. And that was life in cotton growing areas. You didn't want to spray when school was, kids were going to school or kids were coming out of school. You didn't want to spray when people are having their session at the beer garden. There were all sorts of social issues involved. And then people started to wonder about, what about our waterways? We're starting to get fish dying. 
there was huge amounts of endosulfan in the water. Now with BT cotton, it's only sprayed once or twice a year, usually for the other insects that weren't heliothus. So the reason why BT cotton became such a success is realistically it's social license. Endosulfan and beer gardens don't mix. Plus the cotton is mostly Roundup ready. Overall, cotton, BT cotton as grown in Australia has an 89% decrease in pesticide use. And that's a massive drop in the amount of chemicals that are being use, used on cotton. There's also the fact that we don't eat cotton, right? We wear it, so people are more comfortable with that. We're comfortable in our cotton clothes because we don't eat it, unless we go to the local fish and chip shop because they, when you get all the lint off and turn it into cotton, what do you do with the seed? Well, you crush it because it's got this really good oil in it. And the really good thing about the oil is you can stick it in a deep fryer and you can heat it, you can cool it down, you can heat it, you can cool it down, it doesn't go rancid. You do that with olive oil, it'll stink the next day. The chips will smell like fish, but there won't have been any fish in it. With cottonseed oil, you can do it for quite a long time. It has those wonderful attributes that the fish and chip shop guy likes. BT cotton got released in India. You can see it was released in 2003. The thing you will notice for the first years was there was hardly any increase in the actual area of cotton grown, but production went up because, mostly because, Indian farmers could not afford the chemicals they needed to control heliothus. India became so proud, they became a cotton exporter. They said, we have become middle class because like the rest of the middle class world, we can now send our cotton to China and buy Chinese t-shirts. How's that for a definition of being middle class? <laughs> and the plant scientists live happily ever after. Life was so good. We'd done our work. We're going to keep doing our work. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we didn't live happily ever after because we got schmacked and we didn't even see it coming. Suddenly there was this backlash about GMOs led by people like Greenpeace, etc. They didn't like things about this technology. A number of things were things that they didn't like. Let's talk about some of those, perhaps. Vandana Shiva, who's an anti-GM activist from India, said 400,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide since the failure of BT cotton. Two weeks later, she said 325,000. Then she said 255,000. Then she said 270. She makes it up as she goes along. But she's... Anyway, hundreds of thousands of Indian farmers have committed suicide because of their BT cotton crop failing. Prince Charles, he called it an abomination. He said it's gene tinkering, it's not natural. He actually said that if we all grow these crops, we're going to go into unmentionable awfulness. <laughs> uh, let's not mention Brexit. <laughs> One of my favourites, Zen Honeycutt, she runs this group called Moms Across America. Um, she makes her money out of selling organic produce online. There's actually a really nice movie called Food Evolution, which I'd ask you to see if you were interested in it. But she was interviewed on that. And she said, I don't need scientific studies. I don't need the FDA, the USDA. It's not about science. My moms know what is good for us and our kids. And Gwyneth, I mean, you can read that. I don't know what that means. It means something to Gwyneth, but that's probably what you can expect from someone who runs a website called Goop. <laughs> but there arose a lot of GMO facts. Firstly, GMO foods, they're all toxic. We've also got the 400,000 farmers who have supposedly committed suicide. Then there's BT corn killed monarch butterflies. Farmers are forced to grow GM crops. All GM crops require toxic chemicals or they won't grow, and GM's not organic. GM foods aren't toxic. We've been eating them since 1996. This is a graph of the suicide rate in India amongst female and male um, farmers in the cotton growing states, and it's continued that trajectory, it's going down because people are actually growing more and more cash crops. They're making money. 
they're able to send their kids to school, they're able to buy shoes for their kids because they're actually making money out of growing cotton. There's also reports saying that many of the farmers were committing suicide by drinking glyphosate, um, which we'll talk a little bit about glyphosate as we go on, but you'd have to drown in it before you could actually die of the toxicity. So we've busted that myth. BT corn didn't kill monarch butterflies. It did if you took pollen and put it all over the surface of a petri dish and then put a couple of monarch butterfly larvae on it. There was enough BT toxin in some of the pollen to do that. But it turns out that they just never got enough of that pollen or BT from the leaves to die. And in fact, one of the bigger reasons for the, I mean, there's, of course, there's climate change, but I would say there is evidence to suggest that one of the bigger reasons for the decline in monarch butterfly populations in North America is actually from Roundup Ready crops, because there's less weeds. They eat the weeds in cornfields and soy fields. Because so many of those are now clean because of Roundup, clean of weeds, the food source has gone down. I've already discussed this, farmers aren't forced to grow GM crops, then there's this one. We have to put terrible chemicals on them. This is uh, corn or maize. This is what corn borer looks like. It's not pretty. Um, if you have BT corn, the larvae dies in the first day of eating whatever it is. A bigger problem with, it's not so much the loss of a few grains, a bigger problem with those corn borers is they bore in through that side of, the, you know, we've got that, those wonderful leaf sheets around the outside of the, of the corn, and then that allows the entrance of fungi, fungi like Aspergillus and Fusarium, which actually produce toxins. So aflatoxin being one of the major causes of liver disease and liver cancer in people who are eating mouldy grain. So you can reduce that as well. And producing, for example, fungal disease resistance, you don't need fungi. Uh, sorry, you don't, you don't need a fungicide. This is powdery mildew in grapes. This is a terrible thing, Phytophthora infestans, late blight in potato. You might have heard of it. I saw Andre Drenth here in the lab. He did his PhD on it. He taught me all about it. I know more about potato blight than anyone in the room except Andre. I know 1% of what Andre knows about it. So that one's not quite right either. Then we've got the issue about GM. It's not organic. Have you eaten organic food today? All the time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Organic means relating to or derived from living matter. All foods organic, uh, except maybe salt. And as we know, we're not going to eat salt anymore. That's the main cause of death in people. It doesn't even matter if it's pink. Pay more for the pink, <laughs> it'll kill you just as quickly. Although it might be organic. Because some of them are labelled as that. But may, I'll, I'll accept that because where the, isn't the pink colour supposed to come from the, the, the shrimp that lived in the salt beds? <laughs> Certified organic is what people are saying when they mean GM is not organic. Certified organic is different. Like, <coughs> quite different. Um, if you're religious and you know that there are other people who have a variant of your form of religion and they call themselves Presbyterian or Baptist or I, I might be Islamic but I'm a, a Shia rather than a Sunni, etc. Organic certification schemes are just like that. They are different religions. They truly are. Certified organic rules are quite clear, however. In Europe, you're allowed to use copper as a fungicide on your potatoes to control late blight. So it's a good fungicide. In 2001, the EU decided we're going to limit that to eight kilograms a year. And then 
A few years later, they dropped it to six kilograms. Why? Well, copper's a little bit toxic, but also it was building up in the soil. It was actually becoming quite a good herbicide. Nothing else would grow. <laughs> the UK Soil Association, they're one of the organic groups, says you can use six kilograms per hectare per year, but only if you tell us. You have to fill out a form and tell us you're using it. But if it's a really wet year, we'll actually let you use a little bit more, but you still have to apply. Germany and Switzerland said, no, 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 it's getting too toxic. We're dropping it to between three and four. And then other parts of Europe, Scandinavia, Netherlands said, no, no copper. No copper is allowed in organic or conventional farming. Uh, some of the outcomes of that is that in the Netherlands, if you want to buy organic potatoes, you have to get them from Germany. <laughs> but with grapes, it's different. Eight kilograms wasn't going to cut it with grapes. Powdery mildew is a terrible disease, so if you want to grow, if you want to have your organic wine, know that it has probably been sprayed with up to 38 kilograms of copper. So they're clearish. The only thing they would agree on is that GM crops are not organic because they're not natural. Spraying huge amounts of copper sulphate on crops is totally natural. We can all appreciate that. I don't want to make fun of organic, but I do want to make fun of organic marketing. 100% chemical free. What was the last time you ate something that was 100% chemical free? Did you enjoy it? I mean, even if you're a breatharian, there's still oxygen and nitrogen. I think they're chemicals. This one really gets to me. There's a surf shop on the Gold Coast that sells chemical free zinc cream. But I do want to make fun of biodynamic agriculture. Here's a biodynamic ice cream. No, no, it's Preparation 500. Preparation 500 is a cow horn. You fill it with manure. You dig holes in autumn. You bury it. In spring, you bring it back out of the soil because it's done wonderful things. You then grind it up and you add water and you spread the contents of that cow horn with its manure over one hectare. The amount of nitrogen in these grains here is more than you would get out of that, just those few grains, is more than nitrogen than you would get out of that Preparation 500. It's a pagan ritual, I think, is the best way to look at it. But wait, there is more. They go up to 508. Uh, uh, you know, they do sound like Levi's jeans, don't they? Um, my favourites are 504. It's stinging nettle. What does it do? Well, it helps the soil to develop an intelligence to accommodate the particular plants which are growing in it. <laughs> Put a bit of stinging nettle in the soil and it's, oh, I'm ready for that sugar beet this year. Last year, I didn't really like what I had last year, that barley, but this year I'm ready to go. And 502, well, you've got to kill a stag. It can't be any old deer. It has to be a male deer, not a female deer. That'd be dough. Um, so you get a stag's bladder, you put yarrow flowers in it, you hang it up in the sun during summer, and then you bury it. You don't actually spread it out. I don't know what it does, but it sounds good. I'm not even sure what yarrow is. I'm sure it's very pretty. But part of the narrative that came across from this whole thing was it was big ag, big mean ag versus organic. It was David versus Goliath. And Goliath was the most evil corporation in the world, Monsanto, who were also known as Monsatan. It's been taken over by a German company called Bayer. So now Greenpeace has a marketing opportunity. They can't have a march which is millions against Monsanto. They can do billions against Bayer. How good is that? And who doesn't like the underdog? I mean, after all, look at Monsanto here, evil company that it was, even though it doesn't exist anymore. Annual sales of 15 billion. That's inconceivable. Uh, wouldn't you love a piece of that action? Whereas poor little Whole Foods Market, with their wheelbarrows out the front with organic purple and red corn chips that were grown lovingly by a Mexican farmer up in the highlands to keep it away from evil GM crops. Their annual sales are not nearly that much. They're exactly the same. And they've been taken over by Amazon.
But remember, organic agriculture is 100% chemical free. Remember that messaging. Organic agriculture only has allowable inputs. They don't use chemicals, they use allowable inputs. Here's a list of their allowable inputs. Uh, one of my favorites is rotenone. It's the ground up root of a plant. It's got an oral lethal dose of 60 milligrams in rats. What does that mean? It means oral lethal dose is you get a population of rats, you feed them with a certain dose, and you get the dose until half the rats have died. So it's the oral lethal dose that kills 50% of the population. This is why we don't do this experimentation in humans. In fact, a lot of it we don't do in rats anymore either. We don't think that's really fair for the rats. Um, Caffeine's pretty poisonous as well. It's only half as poisonous as rotenone. You need twice as much of it. Um, that's about as much as you'd get in perhaps 28 to 30 espressos. So don't drink 28 or 30 espressos. Copper sulphate, of course, it's pretty toxic. Lime sulphur, even chocolate. Salt's up there, pink or otherwise. Vinegar, so all the things you put on your salad are more poisonous than glyphosate. So just to highlight there, so glyphosate is the only thing on this list that's not an allowable input. You can use homeopathic remedies on some of your organic preparations if you want, remembering that that's no active ingredient. It's the same as water. Water will kill you as well. The oral lethal dose of water is 900 mils per kilogram of your body weight. It's hyponatria. People have died from drinking too much water. What they really die from is too low a sodium and you keel over and die. We have genetically modified versions of disease resistance plants. We have resistance to powdery mildew and grapes. We have resistance to this terrible late blight. But organic agriculture continues to spray with chemical free copper and has half the productivity. So you need twice as much land area to produce the same amount of that crop. If you don't remember, potato late blight was the cause of the Irish potato famine. And as you can see, this is one of the major plant disease issues in terms of world population. My mum's name is Flanagan. I can probably owe myself the fact that I live in a wonderful place like Brisbane because of this. That's not true. He was sent out as a convict. <laughs> Nina Fedorov said, if the whole world switched to organic, we wouldn't be able to feed the world. We'd maybe be able to feed half. Because most crops, you can only get about half the productivity. So we'd either have to double the land area. We, we could clear the Amazon. That'd be fine. We could grow organic agriculture in the Amazon. But is that what we want? Klaus Ammann actually went a little bit further than that. He said the Nazis put out all that fake news about Jews and how bad they were. And he said the anti-GM activists, the Greens and Greenpeace in Germany used exactly the same techniques. And now the minds of many people in Germany is closed to further debate. But all we can say is that GM is not certified organic. But the organic industry chose GM as a wonderful way to increase market share and then used links to activists to ensure that the stigmatization of GM crops made people feel a little bit dodgy about it. So how was the only way you were going to avoid eating GM crops? Eat organic, pay double. But currently still there's 10 different crop species released with GM traits. But the Australian Greens say GMOs, this is on their website, this is their official policy, GMOs have not been proven safe to human health. Substitute any one of those other words in there. Believe it or not, every single one of these has killed people. Even bathrooms. Did you know that the bathroom is the place in your house where you are most likely to have a fatal accident? Did you know that horses are the animal that kills more Australians than any other animal every year? I've already talked about water. 23 years of GMO consumption, not a single death and no zombies found either. I'll finish my talk just talking about the new kid in town, genome editing techniques. 
what is gene editing and why should you care? Now, when I was putting this together, I thought, am I going to sing this? And I thought, I'm feeling good. You are going to hear me sing. You know the song, sing along. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. If you read, you begin with ATG, if you're a RNA polymerase 2, that is. <laughs> Let's see if I can make this any easier for you. Doe, a beer, uh, oh, a gender neutral beer. We can't do female or male here. We're doing gender, although this is Tor's hammer. So maybe it's not gender neutral. It's actually barley wine. It's about 9% alcohol. It tastes absolutely fantastic. Two of these, you won't walk for days. <laughs> but a case study, you drink beer, what happens? Beer contains ethanol. Most of you know that. Ethanol is a flavour enhancer. Too much so for some humans. This tastes so good. It's also a toxin and a carcinogen. But fortunately for us, we've got livers. Your liver comes to the rescue. It produces an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. The gene is actually in every cell of your body, but it's only expressed in the liver. It's switched on. And it's actually switched on. It gets upregulated when you get that beer into your blood system or any other form of ethanol, which is good. You can actually train your ADH1 to be more active. To do that, you drink more barley wine, beer, scotch, whatever you want. You can train your enzymes to be more present, ready to go. ADH1 expression is quite complicated, but I'm going to try and make it seriously. The, the genes all hang around together on your chromosome 4, and there are variants of different types. So ADH1C, there are variants of that that protect against alcoholism. There are other variants that increase the risk of al alcoholism, so it just depends on which gene you have. There are variants on ADH1B. When it's defective, you can't break down alcohol very well. The outcome of that, you get a red face soon after drinking. Some of us have got friends who we go out and they have half a beer and suddenly their face turns red. You have to start to wonder, have you been eating cream of celery soup? But no, <laughs> it's to do with the ADH1 gene. So these are all called alleles, they're variants, they're just different versions of the gene. They, they express more, they express less. They don't express at all, they express a different enzyme or they express in response to different signals. Anyone want some foie gras? So I've just changed your gene expression. You're looking at that and thinking, oh, that's disgusting. I quite like chicken livers myself, but usually when they're a bit more processed than that. Gene editing is a way to change gene expression. So we can do all these things. We can make them express more, less, not express at all, etc., or express in response to different signals. So we can go from something that's rust susceptible to rust resistant. We can go from something that's got horns and something that's got polled. Now, those of you who are looking and are into this sort of thing will notice that there's other differences about these as well. One's a female and one's a male. <laughs> but wait on, isn't this a GMO? Surely this is a GMO. It sounds like GMO to me. Well, if you live in North America, it's not. If you live in Japan, it's not. If you live in South America, it's not. If you live in Europe, they decided, yes, it's a GMO. In Australia, it depends, of course. So we have to work out what does it depend upon. So I'm going to give you a few ideas as to what we are allowed to do with gene editing and what we might not be allowed to do. So. If I, this is how I transform sorghum, which is my favourite crop. We shoot genes into plants. It was an American invention, of course. If you want to solve a problem, shoot it, use a gun. You can take a jellyfish protein, we can put it into sorghum, we can get it expressed in different ways. We can say, oh, we only want it expressed in the root tip. Oh, we only want it expressed in the, in the embryo. Oh, we only want it actually expressed in protein bodies inside a developing grain. And we can make pretty pictures with it. It's pretty nice, I guess. If you don't like green, you can get other colours. These are real. You can look at them online. Glowfish. They're from a company called Live Aquaria. Goldfish are so last century. You just need a little bit of UV light in your lighting scheme to, for them to properly show their true colours. But as John once said, John Don once said in 1623, no gene is an island entire of itself. Every gene is a piece of the cell, 
a part of the organism. Well, he would have said that, but genes were only invented in 1906. But with GM crops, we actually put the gene in in a random place. So sometimes we get some random results. Here's an example from my lab. This is sorghum, if you don't know it. This is the wild type sorghum. This is a gene, this is one, a sorghum where we put a gene in. This is a sorghum where we put the same gene in. The difference in the positions that we've got them in, one of them actually led to down regulation of the gene in the growing area and one led to up regulation. So the one with down regulation has got no branches at all. The one with up regulation produces huge amounts of branches. Serendipity, but a very useful finding for us to help to understand these things. But I'm going to talk now about a thing called CRISPR-Cas9. In CRISPR-Cas9, we're not putting in a gene in a random place. We're actually targeting the gene itself. So you need to know, there'll be an exam on this later. You need to know that there's three main components. There's PAM, there's the guide RNA, and then there's the CAS, which is actually the enzyme. That's the thing that does the work. But the PAM and the guide RNA are really important because they say, this is where I want the enzyme to lock onto the DNA and cut it. So imagine, here's a piece of DNA, double-stranded. It's got the PAM on both strands. The guide RNA binds to that around the pan and forms this, this nice hairpin structure. It recruits the Cas9 enzyme. And the Cas9 enzyme says, this is the spot. Time to cut the DNA. And it cuts the DNA. What happens next? DNA repair. Fortunately, DNA repair is a good thing. I am a big fan of DNA repair or I would have died a long time ago, and so would all of you. I know I put you off food earlier with liver. This is my arm, believe it or not. This is the arm of a person who has lived in Brisbane for more than 50 years, and sunscreen didn't seem to actually be developed, chemical-free or otherwise, when I was a kid. If you didn't peel at least once during summer, you were one of those kids who sat inside and read books, right? I'm going to draw your attention, there's various different pigments here. Many of them are to do with mutations. Some of them have turned into cancers. I've had them removed. This white spot here, that's where a particular gene that's involved in the production of pigment has been knocked out and it's become albino. So it's like a reverse freckle, an albino spot. That's a gene edit. It's a gene knockout. There's three possible options when you have DNA repair. Most of the time, it's accurately repaired. Move on into the next generation. Nothing happened here. Other times, you get inaccurate repair. So you might insert the wrong nucleotide. You might miss some nucleotides. You might put ex extra nucleotides there. Sometimes we can actually use a template and say, what we want to do is we want you to put in some specific new nucleotides here so that it totally changes that gene. The important thing is that the inaccurate repair, where we're just getting a little deletion or a little insertion, this will not be a GMO. Repair with a new template, anything that involves template, that's going to be a GMO. Have to remember this is decision pending from the government. The federal government has made the, they've made the rules, they have sent it out to the state governments, they have to get two thirds of the state governments to agree that, yep, yeah, we agree with that. But that's what's probably going to happen in Australia. Why will this not be a GMO? The main reason it won't be a GMO is because the edit is indistinguishable from natural mutation. We can't detect it. It's impossible to police it. My prediction is in Europe, where this has been banned, you're gonna see all sorts of companies releasing new lines of things that have a mutation in there and be saying to the European Court of Justice, you show us that this is made from CRISPR and read my finger. There's lots of CRISPR products already in the pipeline. Resistance to devastating diseases. Improved food quality. This is one of my favourites in the middle. So Kaisha Gao, who we've been doing a bit of work with, she's from the Chinese Academy of Science. The biggest rice growing variety in China. The plant breeder came along and said, can you make this a fragrant rice? She said, sure. She edited one gene. 
It's now a fragrant rice, like a jasmine rice. He said, that was pretty good. Can you do another 10? And she did. Any rice can become a fragrant rice with CRISPR technology. This one here, this is a wild tomato. Just changing six genes gave you larger fruit, more fruit, smaller seeds, higher lycopene content. It's domestication with six genes being changed. It's a pretty neat technology. Our current research on improved feed quality shows us that single gene edits can give us larger grain, more grain, higher protein, higher digestibility for humans and animals. These are some of my favourites, mostly because I like pig. I like bacon too. So I, I, I like pigs until they turn into bacon and then I like bacon. In Europe, poor sign reproductive and respiratory syndrome causes losses of 1.5 billion every year. Some clever scientists noticed in some wild pigs, they were totally resistant to this disease. So they found out that it was one particular gene which had a base pair different to our domesticated pig. And they changed that in the pig. And the pig is totally resistant to this disease. 1.5 billion, one gene. This one. These are my chooks, aren't they good? So, but we know avian flu virus affects all poultry. It's also transmitted to humans. There have been outbreaks of avian flu, most commonly to do with people's proximity to chickens or ducks. A single edit leads to resistance in the fowl populations. It also means they're no longer a host, so they can no longer give us avian flu. So a single gene edit again recognised from a wild relative that doesn't get avian flu. That's a good outcome for not just the, the poultry themselves, but for us. So, as John Don might have said, ask not for whom the Cass enzyme edits, it edits for thee. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, did I mention my book? Love your work, although I'm concerned you've left this lime here right in front of me. Not sure what that's saying. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, fantastic presentation. We're going to take some questions now. So if you've got questions for Ian, write them down, wave them in the air, and um, Dom and Leone will come around and collect those. Uh, there's already a couple of questions coming in on Twitter, so add yours to there as well. Um, we are, of course, back next month while you're writing down your questions. A bit of housekeeping. We are back next month, uh, 13th of May. And the next talk is, what makes a whale song catchy? The answer, of course, is a sick beat. Um, but the, we're talking about humpback whale songs always changing. But how do the whales manage this? And how do they learn from each other and have this song they sometimes sing together? So it'll be a really interesting presentation. We have Dr. Jenny Allen from UQ and Griffith coming along to that. So make sure you join us next month. Um, we have some questions coming in you can bring up. I'll go to Twitter first. Um, so first question from Twitter is from Nicola, who asks, an argument against GM crops, I heard, was that they are infertile and we risk eliminating fertile breeds and then relying on GM forever. Is there anything in that argument? Um, no, but I can understand where it came from. So in the early 90s, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, developed a technology to effectively, once your hybrid had set seeds, those seeds were effectively dead, they could not germinate. Um, they were talking to companies about licensing it. Companies like that, because it, it was enabled them to protect their, their IP, the genes couldn't get out there. They also liked the fact that there would be no gene flow to wild relatives. Greenpeace heard about it and called it Terminator technology and said Monsanto developed Terminator technology to make sure that farmers have to buy their seed every year. So there was a few little uh, furfies in, in that one. Um, farmers who are farming hybrid crops, they have to buy their seed every year anyway because they're getting an F1 hybrid. If they keep their seed, they'll get a segregating population of fairly useless things in the next generation. 
And again, I'd say, and they wouldn't pay for those F1 hybrids if they weren't giving them an advantage. Great. Uh, next question is from Howard, who asks, with new medications, there is a set period of safety testing. What is the period for GM crops? Obviously more than 23 years, hey? <laughs> I, just, I mean, how do you answer that? So GM crops, um, so in Australia, it's the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator who looks after the GM crops. They're part of the Department of Health. One of their main things is they're looking for environmental impacts, human health impacts on farm and off farm. But the food impacts, that's looked at by Fazanza Food Standards Australia and New Zealand. So they will look at those, uh, any sort of issues about it as well. I can give you a really good example um, of this. So um, back in the early days, people were trying to improve the nutritional quality of soybean. So they said the biggest problem with soybean is it lacks sulfur amino acids, mostly methionine. They said, let's get a gene from something that's high in methionine. And they searched around and they found a gene from a Brazil nut and they put it into soybean. Hey presto, the soybean's really high in methionine. Awesome. And then an allergenist said, that gene from Brazil nut, are you aware of the fact that a lot of people are uh, actually allergic to Brazil nuts? And that outcome of this story is, guess what? It was the very gene from Brazil nut that they transferred to soybean that they were able to test on people who they knew had a Brazil nut allergy and they were allergic to those soybeans. It was actually the first protein to be fully identified in science as an allergen. So you could say that was an outcome, a good outcome of GM, but you could also say that the pre-testing that occurs before you released it was also what stopped that from being released. Great. Um, I've got a question here, uh, maybe a fun one. Given that sequencing of DNA has dropped significantly in cost and time, where do you see gene editing technology will be in 10 years? 10 years, it'll be the sort of thing, this is, this is, I have a dream. My dream is that it will actually be just a standard plant breeding technique. Now at the moment, we have to use tissue culture techniques to make these edits occur. Um, what we're working on is a way to deliver the Cas9 enzyme and the guide RNA. Oh, if I tell you how we're going to do it, I'm going to have to kill you all before you <laughs> get out. But we believe... If he feeds you celery afterwards, you'll know that he right. said too much. We believe we have some technologies that will enable, enable us to deliver those in a glasshouse to large numbers of plants, creating gene edits while the plant grows. Um, someone very soon probably not us because we don't have the millions of dollars that other people do, but wouldn't it be nice? Someone will develop this technology and it will be available in the next few years. So gene editing will become really cheap. Mm. Um, we have a question from uh, J Jordan on Twitter who asks, <laughs> Ian, what's the strongest argument against GMOs? Sorry for throwing you under the bus. Was that you, Jordan? <laughs> When's your confirmation for your PhD? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, we've been caught into this web of intrigue. Game of Thrones has started early. The strongest argument against GM. Well, I would say the strongest argument against GM is that it's very, very costly. And so... It's, one, it's become, this is why gene editing is so exciting. If we can do gene editing in a glasshouse and make it routine, we don't have to do GM anymore for many of the traits we're interested in. At the moment, if you want to make a GM crop and release it, it'll cost you 20 to $30 million just to get that through all the regulation and to show that it's safe. That's the biggest downfall of, of GM technology, I would say. And what that means is that's why it's been only a few crops that it's available in. So maize, canola, soybean, for example, GM is available in those because they are big crops worth many, many billions of dollars around the world. We're pushing, uh, we're, we're pushing something uphill, um, trying to get sorghum, our GM sorghum's accepted, and it turns out that very probably we won't, 
and the companies are more interested in, interest in, in our CRISPR technology to do gene editing. So that's probably what will make it into sorghum because it's just not a valuable enough crop. Most of the people who eat sorghum on a daily basis live in sub-Saharan Africa. They're mostly subsistence farmers. There's no money in sorghum. Hmm. A um, couple more questions. One from Joey Dav on Twitter, who asks, what happens to nutrient content after genetic modification? Uh, well, there's a, some of the first testing that was done was called substantial equivalence. And substantial equivalence was to demonstrate that tomato A and tomato B, this is a variety called Moneymaker. This is a variety called Moneymaker, which has got a gene in it that makes it ripen more slowly, so you can leave it on the, on, on the shelf or in the fruit bowl for a longer period of time. Substantial equivalence meant you'd look at all the nutrients in it, they're no different. Right. Uh, we're almost out of time, but one more question. Jerry asks, what is harder, doing research or writing a book? <laughs> That's a really good question. Writing a book was hard, but it was liberating. If you've ever read a scientific paper, yeah, they're just not exciting. You can say all sorts of stuff when you're writing a book. And so read the book and see all the sorts of stuff I've said. <laughs> nice one. Here, please join me in thanking our fantastic speaker, Ian Godwin. Look forward to seeing you on next. Please join us for some food and drink outside. <laughs>